like all organisms, when, when, when plants live, they allocate the energy they take in to three different basic functions. To growth, to maintenance, and to reproduction. And for crop plants, we're mainly interested in plants allocating as much energy as possible to reproduction and to seeds, in the case of, of most crops. Um, but, but maintenance, and so in, any energy that they spend on maintenance is energy that we can't, we can't benefit from. And if there are higher temperatures at night, then there's going to be higher respiration at night. And so the plant is spending more of its photosynthate on just maintaining its lifestyle, um, rather than putting that photosynthate, the carb, fixed carbon, into, uh, into grain. And so the yields are lowered for that reason as well. And then the third reason yields are lowered, and these are pretty steep declines, uh, the third reason it's lowered is because of pollination stress. Corn, in particular, is very sensitive to high temperatures during about a 10-day period during pollination. And that's because um, when, uh, when pollen is flying in the air and the corn is tasseled and forming these pollen tubes, which are the individual silks, right, that are part of the tassel, those are actually pollen tubes that capture the pollen and then the pollen lands on the tubes and the sperm swim down the pollen tubes to fertilize the embryo, which is the cell, which is the kernel of corn, uh, if that gets interrupted or slowed, then there's less fertilization of the individual kernels and you end up with cobs that have fewer kernels and less yield. So all three of those things can lead to declining yields. And this is, uh, this is not model projections, this is actual yield declines during uh, 1980 to 2007 in Illinois and Indiana uh, data, showing that with the change in maximum temperature, as temperature gets warmer, the yields, the historical yields have declined. Now the yields are not massive. This is on the order of, of, of two megagrams. I should have put this in bushels per hectare. Um, but this is on the order of, of a five to eight percent yield decrease um, overall. So it's not, we're not looking at crop failure here, but we are looking at, at significant declines in an industry that is often profitable only at the margins. It's more severe for corn than it is for soybean, in part because the corn pollination is more um, is more time sensitive and also because uh, the grain filming is a bit more uh, a bit more sensitive in the, in the corn than it is the soy. It also happens in wheat, it happens in other crops also. So lower yields for grain crops, but the lower yields due to temperature are largely offset by elevated CO2. So here's where CO2 is our friend, unbelievably, and I hate to say that out loud, um, <laughs> which is elevated CO2, of course CO2 is our friend. Um, when we do the models, when we use crop models to predict the changes in yield with elevated temperature for corn and soybean, and we've done this, not myself specifically, but uh, crop modelers have done this for all different crops. For corn, you can see that elevated temperature leads to about a minus 2.5% change in yield with a relatively modest change in temperature. But the elevated CO2, the 440 parts per million, which is expected in, uh, in about 30 years, uh, will largely offset that, and so we end up with around a 1% decline, which is a very livable decline, <coughs> frankly. Uh, soybeans, the news is even better, because soybeans, because they have a different photosynthetic pathway, they respond to CO2 very differently, much more aggressively, and so the change in yield with soybeans um, will be 7.4%, and we're also, in Michigan, uh, in the Midwest, we're, in, we're still in the, the zone at which uh, soybeans can benefit from elevated temperature for varietal reasons. Uh, so the combined effect is that we'll probably see about a 9% increase in soybean yields over this period. So that's, you know, that's good news, right? Okay, so that's maybe the only good news I have. Keep that in mind. Okay, because this, this is where it starts getting depressing. Um, <laughs> And that, that's the basis for ill-mannered climate change. Okay, so consider uh, a normal distribution of temperatures across a year, in a, uh, or any, any portion of a year, but across a year here. So we have temperature around, along the x-axis here with cold on the left, hot on the right, and the average, you know, the temperature distribution is a bell-shaped curve. This is, is wonderfully reproducible. Um, it's a normal distribution, and the average occurs at the same place in the median. It, it occurs right here. But what happens in a warmer climate, right? We're talking about the average increasing, correct? So this curve shifts to the right, right? So we've got a warmer climate by 1.5 degrees so far, 
by another two to, two to 10 degrees in the next 50 years, that now has a new average. And we talked about well regulated, you know, well mannered climate change as being relatively easy to, uh, I shouldn't say easy, but relatively straightforward to deal with uh, because of this. But what's also happening is change at the extremes. And on the left side, we have under the current climate, we have a certain proportion of, of the temperatures during a given year are going to be considered extreme cold, right? And in a warming climate, what's going to happen? There'll be fewer of them, right? So we move over here, now we have fewer extreme colds, at least what we consider extreme now, based on current temperatures. On the right side of the graph, you're probably ahead of me on this. On the right side of the graph, under a normal, uh, under a normal climate, normal climate, uh, we've got this portion as, as extreme events, but with this shift to a new climate, using the same metric of what's hot, we now have a much larger proportion of the distribution considered hot weather. And we have a whole nother set of extremes that are outside of our current <laughs> historical <coughs> experience, right? So this is the basis for extreme events. The basis for well-mannered, the basis for well-mannered change is simply a shift in the average. But the, the, the basis for the ill-mannered climate change is a change in these in these extremes. So now I'm going to talk a bit about about the extremes. But first, I have a really cool uh, map I want to share with you. I got this a couple weeks ago at a DOE meeting uh, in Washington, and this is January temperatures. And we all think of January as being one of the coldest. January is on record for us, and it is, no question about that. If you look at this map, and this is a, a map color-coded in these big, large, uh, <coughs> large swaths. Uh, if you look at the, the, the temperatures that are classified here as record coldest in blue, darkest blue, much cooler than average, cooler than average, near average is, 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 uh, is, is, is no color, warmer than average, much warmer than average, and a record warmest. Well, no surprise, we are in much cooler than, we had a much cooler than average January. And that's represented right here in this swap, all the way down the Midwest, uh, down into Georgia. But look at how, how limited that distribution is. California had near record uh, warm temperatures, as did Fairbanks, Alaska. It rained twice, I was told by a colleague who works there in Fairbanks this February. It never rains in Fairbanks in February. If you just step back, you've already stepped back, and, and Look at the number, you know, just look at the relative amount of blue versus red here. It's pretty clear that, you know, despite the fact that we've experienced an extreme winter, the rest of the world has not. This has been the warmest southern hemisphere on record, and it's the fourth warmest January in the northern hemisphere. You know, one of the coldest for us, but over the whole hemisphere, one of the, uh, uh, the, the fourth warmest. So we need to keep in mind that, um, that, that while we think of weather changes in climate has been immediately around us, of course, an experience can be very different, just half a continent away. Okay, so, so what, what does uh, what does ill-mannered climate change mean? Well, one thing it means is that there will be less predictable and more episodic, episodic rainfall. And this has already happened. This is, a, this is historical data uh, from the 19, 1900, uh, this is the uh, decadal averages from 19, 1900 to 1910 up to the 2000 to 2010, and you can see quite readily that they, against the average over that period that we're seeing a lot more once in five year, greater than two inch precipitation events um, compared to 1901 and 1960. Um, so that's happened and farmers know it. Uh, they'll tell you that it rains uh, harder and less frequently now than it did uh, when they were farming 20 years ago. This has also been, so that was for the, uh, that was for um, the national, uh, the national situation, but the Michigan, the Midwest situation is similar um, in that, it, in fact, it's almost identical. No point to believe it. Uh, it's just another way of looking at it. the heaviest one percent of all daily events. Uh, the global projections are that we'll see more of the same. So this is a, a simulated uh, rain storminess over the course of the globe uh, up until the present time, and then we're seeing, depending on the on the emission scenario, we expect this this uh, 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 to increase. We're also going to expect more heat waves. Um, if we look at the days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we can expect 10 to 15 more days per summer above 95 degrees Fahrenheit in southwest Michigan. 
Um, this is the expected increases in number of hottest days compared to 71 in 2000. Um, so this is this is a, a pretty uh, you know, this is pretty unavoidable. Um, but the thing about heat waves is that they don't just occur in the summer, right? They also happen in the winter, and when they happen in the winter, they affect certain crops a lot, and in particular fruit crops. <coughs> So wintertime heat waves, such as early, uh, early heat waves, that can force bud break in fruit crops, such as happened in 2012 uh, in, in Michigan, and in uh, 2002 to the tart cherry crop. And in both cases, uh, about $100 million of tart cherries were lost to early bud break, followed by normal frost, right? It's not that the frost came early and, and obliterated things, it's that buds broke early um, and, uh, and, and, and ended up uh, uh, killing the flowers that were still on the uh, still on the tree that already broken, and that of course can be devastating to, to yields. Summer heat waves uh, lowers yields in grain crops. That's what we <coughs> talked about for these three reasons. Also magnifies water stress because of evapotranspiration. Here's an example of what happens to uh, grain crops when uh, excessive heat during pollination for corn, where you you bought corn in the supermarket or at the farmer's market where the, the top part of the cob is not filled up. Those are aborted for one reason or another, or they were just never pollinated. Um, less frequent, more intense rainfall also increases periodic water stress, and there's an increased erosion risk. Um, but there are ways to get around that, um, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So all told, what we're going to see are warmer winters with more thaws, spring heat waves, earlier winter springs, and hotter summers with more intense rainfalls. And farmers are adapting already. And uh, in part, we know this from work that my colleague Julie Dahl, who is here, has done in interviewing farmers across <coughs> Michigan with colleagues, uh, holding focus groups and surveys and so on. And we know that farmers are buying longer season varieties already, of the commodity crops in particular. We know they're investing in bigger field equipment. And when you ask them why, it's because they want to get out and do stuff quickly in the spring before it rains again, because rainfall is, is, is less predictable. Uh, we know that they're installing irrigation. You can see that around Southwest Michigan very easily. Just in the past two years, since 2012, the number of irrigation systems that have gone in is just, is just mind-boggling. And they're installing frost protection, especially up in the uh, Traverse City region. You see wind machines being installed in orchards um, and then other, other, uh, uh, other, other adaptations to uh, protect against, against frost. Now, over the long term, uh, there is, unfortunately, no magic bullet. Um, and this includes genetics. So regardless of what you hear from the seed companies, um, there is no magic genetics out there that's going to solve this issue. It will, it will ameliorate it to some extent, perhaps. Um, but, the, the, but, um, but different crop varieties, different, uh, different breeding, and so on, will be part of the adaptation toolbox, but it won't make the difference that some would like to think it would make. More likely, we'll be seeing different crop varieties and different crops over the next 50 years. Uh, we'll be seeing more irrigation, more intensive pest management, perhaps more uh, conservation tillage systems going in, more frost protection, animal cooling systems. I haven't said anything about animals, but heat stress in animals is pretty important. And, and, uh, and keeping them cool is an important aspect of their, their productivity. But essentially, variability is the new normal. So I have colleagues who talk about the new climate normal, and what they're often, what they're often talking about is, is the new variability. So just a couple of slides about, about, what, about how agriculture can help stabilize climate. I could put a 45-minute talk together about either one of these topics pretty readily. One of them is greenhouse gas management, doing things like planting no-till to capture carbon in soil and managing nitrogen more efficiently so there's less nitrous oxide, an important greenhouse gas, less nitrous oxide emitted from fertilizers are things that, that farmers can do to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint of of, uh, of agriculture. Uh, we can also think about cellulosic biofuels. Uh, not grain-based biofuels, but cellulosic biofuels, biofuels made from, from, from uh, cellulosic biomass uh, that is either turned into ethanol, turned into drop-in hydrocarbons, or burned directly for electricity as another promising mitigation strategy. Um, there's a lot embedded in this slide. I'm going to flip through it very quickly because I'm, I'm running out of time a little bit, but more importantly, perhaps, the next slide has the, the, important, the important piece. Uh, but I've got this animated. So if we look at, at, the, at the CO2 sources, the greenhouse gas footprint, 
components of a typical corn and soybean wheat rotation system in Michigan. This is actually data from Southwest Michigan. Uh, we find that a conventional system has, has uh, carbon accumulating from fuel and nitrogen fertilizer use, also from uh, nitrogen fertilizer production and also greenhouse gas production. No-till system, the same thing. But in a no-till system, we have the potential for storing carbon in the soil, which can counteract the effects of the, of the, of the carbon that greenhouse gases that are produced. And cover cropping has effectively the same effect. So even if we can't no-till, if we cover crop, we can also capture carbon. And that can lead to not just a reduction in the greenhouse gas footprint of a conventional system, but actual mitigation. That is capturing more carbon than uh, was uh, actually uh, produced. So that, that's one promising technology uh, that, that's available in the future. The other is biofuels, which is, of course, is plant material used to generate energy. And we've talked, well, we, we, we've seen the evolution of biofuels from first generation wood to second generation grain ethanol and biodiesel, which is where we are now primarily with grain ethanol. And in the third generation, where we'll be in the next 10 uh, years or so, is the cellulosic uh, biofuels. And the advantage of cellulosic biofuels is that it, it, it's about, um, seven to 15 times better than grain-based biofuels at displacing atmospheric CO2. And importantly, there's no food fuel competition if you grow that biofuel on marginal lands. And we've done this assessment for Southwest Michigan, as well as for the entire Midwest, and shown that marginal lands, if they were planted to cellulosic biofuels of a particular species, we can get huge conservation benefits in addition to the climate mitigation uh, that, that would also, uh, that would also uh, uh, result. Sure. So if, yeah. um, I, I don't understand with the biofuels, um, I mean, if you end up burning carbon, you're going to get CO2. I, but how, how are you, I'm sure you're avoiding it, but how do you avoid that? Yeah, so, so, the, so the, the simplest way to explain it is that you're, you're putting CO, you're avoiding the need to put fossil CO2 into the air by displacing gasoline that would otherwise be burned and release fossil CO2, so adding to the greenhouse gas burden. So with, with biofuels, you're capturing CO2 in one year, and then you're releasing it the next year. So there's no net change to the uh, atmosphere okay. concentration. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so far, uh, climate change is happening now. It's affecting farmers. Uh, trends are going to continue, likely to accelerate. Michigan farmers are going to adapt. They're already adapting now with new technologies. However, it will be costly. And it will be very disruptive to have different opportunities. But also the mitigation opportunities are, 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 uh, are available. So if Liz will allow me another, another two minutes, I want to I talk about what we can do as local activists, as it were, or even as individuals. Um, <clears throat> top 10 actions are to demand effective policy to limit carbon emissions. This is, a, this is a national scale problem. It's not going to be solved by individual efforts at, uh, at the local scale. It will help, no question. But it's going to take concerted effort at the national policy level, which will mean either a revenue neutral carbon tax, that would be the quickest, as we heard last week in Hassan's talk, the quickest way to get, uh, to get, um, to get mitigation. Carbon revenue neutral so that it doesn't penalize um, those who can least afford to pay it. Uh, and or perhaps a cap and trade market, or and also renewable energy. So all three of those areas are ripe for policies at the national level that would help to mitigate uh, the effect of climate on, on our agriculture. The next three are even lower on the food chain, purchasing fewer processed foods, and buying local and green where possible. Now, if one does a life cycle analysis of how much CO2 is produced from different kinds of products, beef, takes the prize. So beef has about, red meat in particular, has about 150% more CO2 cost than chicken or fish or vegetable-based protein. And it's a little bit surprising that it's that high, but a number of very carefully done studies have documented this now. Um, transportation, the other surprising thing is that transportation doesn't matter much. Yeah, there's about 1,000 miles involved in transporting food to the U.S. household, but it represents only about 4% of the total CO2 cost of the food in a typical U.S. household. And so we hear a lot about food miles and so on, but you know, it really doesn't matter so much. There are, there, there are much better reasons for buying local. But, um, but carbon, carbon uh, 
Carbon avoidance is not necessarily not necessarily one of them. Much more important is diet change. Um, beef is huge. Farmed fish is huge. Shrimp and salmon in particular. Um, but chicken is surprisingly uh, surprisingly uh, small, as are as you would expect the uh, uh, the, the grain based commodities. This is the Michigan product. <laughs> How many of you can read this? This is this global warming salsa um, that, uh, that, that I found on a Buy Michigan webpage uh, a couple days ago. I thought it was kind of cool. It's, it's produced out of, out of Clarkville, Michigan. Um, so, you know, however we can raise awareness about this is good, but um, this is one of the more creative aspects I've seen. And what happens if we do nothing? Well, the most likely do nothing alternative is, is this. I have a colleague who developed this and like to show it. Actually, Jeff and Dreesen, the state climatologist, and suggests that uh, if we do nothing in the high emission scenario, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be growing sorghum and cotton in Michigan at the end of the century. That's a little extreme, but uh, you know, if we continue down our current path by 2040, we're going to have a climate much more similar to southern Ohio and southern Indiana. That's very believable based on the trends we've seen now. Um, so. You know, we're, we're, we're going to see some, some, some shifts. They're going to be unpleasant in some cases. Um, they're going to be unpredictable in some cases. But this general shift here, which is largely the well-behaved climate change shift, is um, almost certain without very, very active and rapid mitigation threat, uh, technologies. So I'm going to stop there. and. Once you're on that site, you need to go to activities. There's a tab on the left that says activities. I couldn't find it under the activities tab. Oh, really? Because it's basically kind of like, thank you. Yeah, it's like the activities tab. Yeah. 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 I'm having a hard time hearing what you were looking for. Ice chasers. Ice chasers? Yeah, it was chasers? last Saturday. I'm sorry. Okay, I figured I'd probably yeah. miss but, uh, it. They, but they, they, not under the activities section. Uh, uh, St. Tom's has that film available, and they're going to make it available to other groups that may want to show it. Okay. Uh, so we might be able to pull it off another one. Chasing ice? Yeah. Yes. Literally. Ice chasing ice. Chasing ice. Chasing ice. Okay. So perhaps that little bit, that particular thing isn't on the website, but there's a, there's a plethora of other things. Trust me. Go there. Go check it out. Okay, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Robertson. Right. What they, uh, when you get to that site, uh, there are two... Uh, hyperlinked tabs you can click on. One of them is, uh, I forget the exact wording, uh, Steve, where are you? Uh, it was something like um, uh, full uh, details of schedule or something like that, full program. And uh, we will be showing in just a minute a, a, a summary of what is going to happen this week. And that was taken from that part of the, uh, the, of the site. Okay. Okay. Dr. Roberts, he will be taking his question, so if you and your group have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, so I'm happy to field whenever I can, but I'll... Go ahead, sorry. Yes. Um, we have two questions.
Um, when we talk about agriculture, we have to talk about systems. Because, um, the agricultural cropping system has all these different pieces related to its management and to the effects of, of you know, effects of a management change here will have unanticipated perhaps or perhaps expected changes possible. So that your gamble no till is a good point that um, the trade off of gaining carbon and getting some drought resistance because as you back up for a second. So no, no till is a technology, I didn't have time to go into it, but it's a matter of of planting your crop into the residue of the preceding crop without plowing. And by maintaining the structure of the soil without plowing, that reduces the microbial activity that would otherwise catalyze the soil carbon the residue that's there from the previous crop. So by not plowing, you're allowing that carbon to stay in the soil. A lot of benefits. One of the benefits is carbon sequestration coming out of the atmosphere. Another benefit is when we build soil organic matter, we build the soil fertility. 